Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar, Customer Lifetime Value Office Hours. Today, we are going to try something different. A few months ago, on our first webinar, Peter and I provided an overview of lifetime value. In that webinar, we covered a lot of ground. We started with um, common marketing metrics, how to measure customer lifetime value, and leveraging customer lifetime value data in your everyday marketing activities. At the end of our first webinar, we also covered a number of case studies of how organizations increase their revenue and profitability by properly applying customer lifetime data. As I remember, at the end of that webinar, we had a lot of questions and emails with a wide range of questions uh, that, were, that were covering a lot of uh, different topics, uh, how to properly measure COV in the different industries, uh, how to apply different models. So today, we decided to focus on answering those questions. Number of questions have been already submitted to us, and they are part of this presentation, or part of this webinar. But uh, please, uh, during this uh, webinar, use the chat panel and uh, post your questions, and we will try to get uh, through as many questions as possible. Again, the goal of this webinar is not just for us uh, to present and share the information, but to answer specific questions uh, that you might have, or items that you might try to accomplish within your organization using CLV. My name is Michael Loban, and I work at InfoTrust. Uh, InfoTrust is a digital analytics, consulting, and technology company. With offices around the world, InfoTrust helps organizations eliminate marketing waste and drive online revenue with analytics. And I'm excited and honored um, to be joined today by uh, Dr. Peter Fader. Every time I hear uh, Pete speak, I've learned a tremendous amount uh, about uh, uh, not just customer lifetime value, but customer centricity and how we should be thinking about our customers and how we should uh, focus on different types of customers to best serve them and to generate value for our own business. Peter is an international authority on CLV and customer centricity. He is a professor of marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. His expertise centers around the analysis of behavioral data to understand and forecast customer shopping and purchasing activities. His work has been published in a number of leading marketing and management journals. He has won many awards for his teaching and research accomplishments. Peter is also a co-founder of Zodiac Metrics. Pete, welcome again. Great to be talking to you, Michael. Glad to see all this interest in the ongoing conversation about CLV. So before we dive into questions, what we want you to do is uh, just uh, cover some background information and uh, have a quick summary of what was uh, covered in our past webinar and uh, why is CLV so important? And I'm happy to talk about that. In fact, I, I, I just came back from an awesome trip. I just spent uh, most of the last week in Iceland, which you might not think about uh, kind of, you know, the, the, the center of all things, customer centricity and CLV, but it might be. Uh, and it's just so great to, to sit around and talk to people and CEOs and, and companies and, and industry associations, uh, and they're just hungry for this stuff. It's not just a matter of pushing it, saying, hey, here's something you haven't thought about before. It's more, tell me, tell me more, tell me more. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, broader use cases. Let's dive into some of the nitty gritty details about different kinds of data structures and different kinds of business settings. And that's what I want to do this morning. I want to make it a little mini Iceland. Uh, I, I imagine that everyone on the line here understands the words that you see on the slide in front of you. You, you get the basic notion of what CLV is. I bet a lot of you have been playing around with it with different degrees of sophistication. You understand a, a bunch of the use cases on the right and some other ones that Michael's going to talk to you about. Uh, but you want to go further. You want to go deeper both with the methods themselves, with the integration uh, into uh, other kinds of strategies and tactics that your firm is following, uh, and to try to get broader buy-in, uh, both for uh, everyone across your firm and your external constituents, uh, so that they can uh, better understand the kinds of investments you're making in your customer base. So I'm not going to give you the CLV 101, because you, you've, you've heard it, you understand it, you don't need it again. Uh, I really want to turn this over to all of you to talk about your experiences, ask some questions of me and Michael, uh, and let's just have a really good conversation about where it's all going. Michael, let me turn it back to you. 
Fantastic. Thank you. And again, as a reminder, please use uh, the chat panel uh, in a go to webinar and ask us uh, questions. Uh, another uh, concept just to briefly touch on as uh, uh, we were looking uh, at this information during our last webinar, really what we find uh, quite valuable uh, when presenting uh, or meeting with organizations talking about uh, customer lifetime value is really uh, seeing uh, how customer lifetime value plays an overall digital marketing landscape, right? So as we think about uh, uh, digital analytic uh, stack within the organization, we tend to it tends to fall into three different buckets, right? We have a uh, different marketing channels uh, that bring people to the website. We have uh, our website or different digital properties that we are trying to measure with tools like Adobe Omniture or Google Analytics, and then we have our user data sets, so we have our own um, a CRM system or point of sale. And uh, what we would want to do is once we have our CLV data, which often ends up living in our uh, internal database, is then how can we use that information and uh, optimize our marketing spend, optimize uh, who we target and how we target those customers based on this data. And uh, at the end of the day, something that we'll probably be discussing today, as it was uh, one of the questions that came up, is the ability to target people based on the CLV information, but also ability for us to identify similar audiences that might have something in common with uh, our current customers that have the highest CLV. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is potentially acquire new customers that might end up being types of customers that will generate the most revenue for our business. And so with that, let's start uh, with, uh, with a Q&A. Now, right now, we don't yet have uh, many questions uh, that have been posted. So uh, some that came uh, to us before the webinar are listed here. So Pete, let's start with the first one. How much data do we need to begin measuring CLV? I love that question. Again, it implies that we already have buy-in and that we want to do it as, as quickly as possible and, uh, and, and we trust it, that we don't necessarily have to wait until we see an entire customer's lifetime to say how good they are. Uh, and I'll say this, it's a, it's a really interesting question because this is really where I'm at right now with a lot of my academic research is, is, is saying how little data do we need? So basically, if you think about your data set as a bunch of, of rows being uh, the, the customers and the columns being some amount of uh, different uh, bits of information that we have about them over time, uh, we want to minimize both. Uh, obviously, we'd like to make statements at the, the customer level, but wouldn't it be great if we could do, if we can get the parameters for our CLV models without having to, to bring in numbers on each and every customer? So, so, so we'll, we'll talk about that, but the first part, would be uh, how do we squeeze the columns down? So instead of having to track and, and leverage every bit of information that we have on our customers. So if you think about the, the, the data warehouse that you have, the, the CRM system, so you have all the transaction data, you have all of their social media activity, you, have, uh, you might have geolocation, biometrics, you, know, you might know something about their social connections, where they stand in the graph. So, so too often we're asking this question the other way, which is, can we bring more data in to get better CLV estimates? And the answer is usually no. Uh, we only want the data that, that really has predictive value to it. And then use all of that other stuff, all that nice descriptive information to help do the kind of sorting out that Michael was talking about earlier. So I'm suspecting that a bunch of you, in fact, I, I wanna see you typing stuff in here, whether it's questions uh, or, or, or thoughts about it. Let's, uh, so of all the different data sorts that, that we start with, first and foremost, and in fact, in many cases, all we need would be the transaction data. And even then, we don't necessarily want to know the time, the nature, all the characteristics of each and every transaction, because that by itself can be overwhelming. So we want to boil it all down. And I want someone to type in whether into, the, into the, the, the question window or the chat box, um, what would be the, 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 the first pass summarization that we do? So we have all of this transaction data. We know exactly who bought what, when, uh, for how much, and so on. Uh, and instead of trying to carry all of that information around, we want to simplify it. We want to summarize it. What would be the right kind of summary? Or as we'd say in more statistical terms, what would be the sufficient statistics 
that basically tell us everything we need to know or most of the, what we need to know out of all of that data without having to try to, 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 try to uh, make use of, of every bit of it. So what are these sufficient statistics? And I see that, uh, that Nahuel uh, mentioned RFM, absolutely. And I bet that every one of you knows that, or at least I hope most of you do. Uh, if not, maybe we have to take a step back, and I'm happy to do so. Recency, frequency, monetary value. Uh, a, a framework that our forefathers in direct marketing handed us really 30, 40, nearly 50 years ago. Um, back then, it wasn't as scientific. It seemed to be more instinct. We just have this sense that these are the metrics that matter most in terms of predictability. But today, we, we, we understand it on a much more scientific basis, as well as having much more empirical support for it, that that really is, in many cases, all you need. Or, or put it this way, it's certainly the right starting point, and you need to exhaust and make the best use of that RFM data before you even think about bringing in other transaction information or some of those other, uh, other kinds of data. Yes, we can augment RFM with some of those other measures, and there's no question that, that there, there's room for, for incremental value from, from uh, some other uh, transactional or non-transactional information, but like I said, but you're going to get yourself 80, 85 percent of the way there with RFM alone. So don't try to run before you walk. So that's step one is kind of collapsing the columns. And then step two is in terms of running the models, um, can we uh, work with aggregated groups of customers instead of having to work with all 10 million of our of our individuals? And, and yes, 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 we can. In fact, if you jump all the way to the extreme of the brand new work that I have, some of you may or probably aren't familiar with it, trying to do customer-based corporate valuation. All we're taking are the aggregated numbers that companies are producing on a quarterly basis to say, how many customers did something with us? How many total orders did we see? No information whatsoever about any one customer. And we find that if you have the right kind of aggregated information, and if you can see it over time, and if you know what to do with it, if you know the right math to run, uh, then you can actually come up with uh, estimates of your CLV models that are almost as, as I, almost identical to, almost as accurate as uh, the models you get if you had all the granular data. And real happy to, to post some information about that paper. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll type in a URL for it. Uh, but but so we can collapse the rows in order to get our overall parameters and then apply them to individual customers to say, okay, so what is this customer worth? What is that customer worth? Collapsing rows, collapsing columns, that's what keeps me gainfully employed. And I think that's what allows more firms to actually dip their toes in the water because they find out they realize that it's not quite as burdensome to, to get going with CLV. You don't have to worry about boiling the ocean. You can get started with relatively simple data structures. So it's a, it's, I'm glad that that's question number one. And I really hope that this answer will provoke other questions or comments that some of you have about data structures structures, data requirements. You know, we got these other ones here, and I'm glad to talk about them, but I'd rather hear the questions uh, that are on the top of your list. So go ahead and type them on in there. Uh, Michael, do you have uh, any thoughts about that one? Uh, not I think about the first one, but maybe uh, we can dive into the next one uh, in terms of the ability to predict the uh, customer behavior. Sure, thanks. How do so uh, how do we know if it's uh, accurate or not? And a lot of times we see this with uh, predictive models uh, uh, when we don't necessarily predict lifetime value, but we predict when uh, uh, what the next purchase is going to be or when it's going to take place. Uh, how do you go through the process of testing it and validating your information? It's such an important point. In fact, I want to take the scenario that you just raised and take one step back from that before we fully explore and appreciate the, the ability and importance of, of long-run predictions, one of the problems with the way a lot of people approach CLV or, or really other kinds of predictive analytics is that they judge their models on, on goodness of fit criteria. And I don't want to get into all the statistical stuff, but it basically becomes a curve fitting exercise. And we say, hey, look at this model that's capturing all the patterns in our data set. And it gives us this confidence that we can capture and explain everything worth capturing and explaining, but that falls far short of the real goal that we have for the model, which is long run predictions at a granular level. So we really have to change the way that we approach model building. We have to start walking away from some of the criteria that we learned back in our statistics 101 course 
they just are kind of natural tendencies to look at in sample fit. And we have to say, yeah, you know, it's look, it's important that the model doesn't fit badly, <laughs> but trying to capture every wiggle and jiggle in our in our calibration data set is not our goal. And if we overdo it, if we overfit the models, that will Absolutely, I guarantee it will hurt the predictions. Uh, and now let me get to, to Michael's point over here. When I'm talking about the predictions, when I'm talking about hurting the predictions by overfitting, I'm talking about the long run stuff. So too often, if you're building your, uh, your models and, and you're making kind of a one step ahead forecast, so let's predict uh, you know, who is gonna buy our product next or, or uh, or when will that next product, that next purchase take place, or how many purchases will take place over the next quarter? We can fool ourselves. Not to say those are unimportant questions. Okay, no, don't, don't get me wrong. Those are important questions. But by focusing too much on those kinds of short-run, kind of next period questions, um, we give ourselves a false set of a sense of confidence that our model will predict well way off into the future. And this is actually a big, big problem with machine learning and other kinds of uh, traditional regression-oriented techniques, that it will do just an amazing job over that next period, but it doesn't do so well when you start looking over a, long, a, a longer horizon, which after all is what customer lifetime value is all about. So we have to be very careful about the methods that we choose and the ways that we use them, in, in particular, the ways that we evaluate them. But when we start thinking about the long run, when we start asking the questions the right way, not uh, will this customer make a purchase in this quarter, but how many purchases will this customer make over their lifetime with us? When we start reframing the questions towards issues that are more related to CLV and more related to, to broader customer-centric strategies, uh, A, it's gonna change the methods that we use. B, it's going to uh, uh, change the, uh, it's going to give us a, a sense of, of what we're capable of doing and see, it's going to also bring in a bit of humility. It will help us uh, understand what we can't predict or what we can't predict with, with a great deal of certainty. So I want to approach these two questions that you see here in a, in a fairly balanced manner. Um, so yes, it is possible to predict customer behavior. It's, it's, it's easy to predict customer behavior if all you're interested in is that short run. And for many cases, that might be all you want. In, in cases like that, if you really only care about next quarter, then don't worry about CLV. Don't even claim to use it. It's probably the wrong tool for you. You want to be using the, the methods that, that have that, that, that shorter horizon orientation. But if you want the, long, the longer horizon, which I hope many of you want to, uh, then you have to use different methods that are less focused on fitting and more focused on predicting. Uh, and then how do we know the predictions are accurate? Well, Hold yourself accountable. Hold the model accountable. In fact, we can start doing this even before we run any models. Let's go back and, in fact, let, let's back up to RFM. Let's talk about the ways that our forefathers determined the effectiveness of RFM all those years ago when they couldn't have even dreamed of the kinds of models that we have today or the kinds of computational power or, or raw data. So way back when, they would split their data set. They would say, let's look at all the data through, well, let's use current years, through 2013 uh, to find out what metrics are most correlated with what we see from 2013 through the first half of 2017. Let's not even run any models. Let's simply find metrics that seem to relate to relatively long-run future behavior, or at least in this kind of holdout data set. And that, that, that's where RFM came from. It was just a recognition that recency, frequency, and monetary value uh, were remarkably related to, and therefore presumably predictive of, um, what we see customers doing over, say, a three to four year or longer horizon into the future. You don't even need a model for that. This is, this is genuine data science. It's not just let's take a data set and kind of look at it and, 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 and make pretty pictures and, and query it and sort things. It, it's creating this kind of, uh, of, of, of period one, period two, and really uh, understanding what is it that's going on in period one that's going to help us make better statements about period two. Now, of course, we don't always have the luxury of being able to split a data set like that. 
that's when we need the model to be able to take the whole data set and, and make bona fide predictions into the future. And so we want to come up with models that will, will work well in this period one, period two kind of way, uh, and will work so well and will be so robust that will be, um, A, relatively insensitive to the way that we define period one and period two. Again, the last thing I want to do is to say that period one is 11 months and period two is one month. Nah, that's, that's, that's too short. So what should we do? Should we do eight and four? Should we do six and six? Do you think we can get away with three and nine in terms of how we split up uh, uh, 12 months of data? Uh, and we want a model that's, that's quite insensitive to, the, to the, the length of that window, to the amount of data that we feed into it. That's a really, really, really important criterion. And if we see, let's say we just do the, the sample split, and if we see that the, the, the same metrics or the same model parameters are relatively stable across our 12-month data set, that gives us that good feeling in the belly that we have a good thing going on here. Number two, we want a model that's relatively robust, not only across time horizons, but across settings, across customer segments, business units, geography, time periods. Uh, and so instead of customizing a model for each and every uh, setting that we have, we want a model that's going to be pretty good. Uh, or, as, or as Larry David would say, pretty, pretty good. <laughs> uh, uh, we don't necessarily want to customize our model for each period. We want one that's, that's you know, pretty good across all of these different settings. So as we start looking at the next chunk of customers, the next time period, the next product that we launch, uh, we'll, we'll have, a, again, some comfort that it will probably be a, a, a decent way to, to go. Yes, we can fine tune it if necessary, but we really don't want to. And number three, we want that model to offer some story, some diagnostics. So not only does it make pretty good predictions, but that we can uh, kind of have some understanding about what's going on. Uh, is it that this group of customers is dropping out faster or buying less frequently or spending fewer dollars when they make transactions? So we want to have that kind of diagnostic value that will help us understand uh, why some groups of customers or, or products are different than others. Uh, what is it that we need to do? Um, maybe what is it that we need to tweak in the model itself? So, so I hope that these approaches, uh, the, the, these thoughts about uh, how we approach the data, how we look at the models, uh, let you know that there really is some good science here, that there really is some repeatability to it, that it's not always a leap of faith, and that you can actually have a, a, a good deal of faith in these models, making these long-run projections. And yes, you can really start to spend money and make the kinds of allocations that Michael and I were talking about earlier. Uh, again, n never with 100% assurance, but with a pretty good idea that this is what's likely to happen in the future. And you know what? Even if it is a little bit off, you'll then have a better understanding about why and what it is that we can change in the model or in our marketing practices to make things a little bit better uh, as we move ahead. So these are really, really important questions, and, and I don't want the answer to be, trust me, that's terrible. That's too, too much of a black box. Uh, but but uh, anyway, I could talk for days about it, but uh, it looks like we have a, uh, a question over here from Stephen Keith. Uh, Stephen's asking, is this going to move beyond the intellectual theorization into practical approaches? Um, yes, these are practical approaches, Stephen and everybody. And I like, I, I'm, I'm glad that you're pushing me on it. These things that I'm telling you to do, take your data, split it, and see what happens from one half to another. That's not theoretical. I'm not a theoretical kind of guy. The theoretical people hate me because my work is, 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 is too practical. So, uh, so I really want people to understand uh, what these models are good at, and, and again, their limitations. Let me just say two words about that, and then we'll get back to, uh, to talking about how we use the models. Um, one of the other limitations is, uh, is making statements about particular individuals. We have the capability to do that. We can run these models and say, given your recency, frequency, and monetary value, here is our best guess about what you will do and what you will be worth. But we only have so much faith in those forecasts at a very granular level. You have to be careful about pushing these models too far. Yes, we want to use the granular data to get the models going, but, uh, but in terms of trusting the predictions, honestly, I'd rather do it at a micro segment of customers. Let's find a group of customers who share a set of relevant characteristics when we acquire them, through what campaign, what product did they buy from us, 
And for customers who share those characteristics, these models will be incredible about making statements about that micro segment as a whole. But this, there will always be a lot of variability around particular kinds of customers. Uh, uh, Stephen, I don't know if, if it's possible for you to, uh, to, to unmute your phone uh, or, or, or type in more, more specifically what you'd like to know about uh, practical approaches. Because again, I'm a practical guy and I'm hoping that everything that I'm saying here, and of course I, I welcome uh, Michael to, to jump in as well, uh, is, is, is born out of practical reality, not theoretical models, uh, and has been applied countless times uh, by uh, specific companies as well as vendors, you know, such as Zodiac and Infotrust and, and others. Uh, so that there, there's, a, a, by now, a, a lot of really good use cases that are emerging, and we want people to fully appreciate them. So Michael, other there, thoughts there? there? Yeah, let me let me jump in for a second as we are waiting uh, for Stephen. I would love to uh, get his other thoughts, uh, another question from him. But uh, one is uh, maybe if Stephen is looking for specific discussions about how to construct a model, maybe the formula that information uh, uh, was covered in uh, in the first webinar that we can share. But it seems like we have a next question from Stephen. Maybe did what we can do is. Uh, uh, many are people I'm sure have heard that, that I believe Toys R Us has uh, recently filed for bankruptcy. So if uh, from the practical standpoint, let's say if you get a call from a, uh, an organization that might say, you know, we, it seems like we are struggling uh, in, in the space of uh, online, uh, we are being crushed by competition and we really want to focus on CLV uh, as a way to uh, shift our focus and, uh, and really excel. Maybe you could uh, walk us through uh, if you had that call, what would be your typical process of getting them on their, in the right track? Maybe that would be a practical approach uh, that people are considering. Happy uh, to talk about it. Sure thing. I think it's, it's, a, it's a good point. So it's not just a matter of reviewing all the use cases, but, but prioritizing them. The first thing I want to do before uh, going out on a limb and, and, and starting to say what you should be doing and so on. First, I want to make sure uh, that the company really understands the, the, the nature of its customer base. So the first things I want to do is just to, to look kind of inside the data set uh, and look at the kinds of patterns. And, and again, Stephen, I, I, I really want to share all these patterns with you. We don't, don't have them in this, this deck over here. Some of them are covered in the other webinar we did, um, or, uh, or if you look at some of the content available on the various websites, uh, just I'll give, the, uh, I'll, I'll give a point or two uh, to, to uh, what, what we have at Zodiac, just a ton of, of blogs and white papers and things there where we lay out both in, in great detail, but also in a very non-technical way, what these patterns tend to look like. I think it's really, really important to know. I mean, let me make it real simple. We acquire a bunch of customers at a given point in time. Uh, what do the sales for that group of customers look like over time? Uh, and it turns out, I wish you could see me kind of moving my hands over here. It turns out that we'll see that for that cohort of customers, we'll see this, this, uh, this decline in purchasing over time. We'll see a, a, a fairly rapid decline for the first few, for the first period. It, it all depends on the, the, the cadence and the product category. But you'll see a fairly rapid drop, uh, drop off. And then it kind of levels off, still going down much more gradually. This is the pattern that we see for almost every cohort. And yes, they can occasionally blip upwards. There can be seasonality. There can be, um, uh, you know, a, a promotion. There can be uh, different kinds of things that will temporarily make that cohort look a little bit better uh, uh, today than it was yesterday. But for the most part, we see this pattern that sounds so dreadful. I didn't make up these words, but uh, the pattern that we call it is buy till you die. That basically this, this group of people uh, will gradually drop out. Uh, and we see this pattern over and over and over again. And the beautiful thing is that we can take a relatively limited slice of data and then project that out uh, either over the next period or two or 10 or forever. So the first thing to do before even running the models, before even trusting me on it, is to look at the data, is to look at the data that you have on this group of customers, okay? And first thing you wanna do is break your data set into 
different cohorts. You do not want to look at the customer base as a whole. That's fruit salad. You want to look separately at the apples and the oranges, the different kinds of customers. Again, based on when you acquired them, maybe through what channel, what was the first product they bought. But time-based cohorts would be the cleanest way to go. So let's look at all the customers we acquired at one point in time and just watch their collective purchasing over time to the end of our data set. And you will see these patterns. You will see this drop-off occurring. And in fact, it will tend to be fairly similar across the cohorts, but you will see some slight cohort to cohort differences. And in fact, I'll even go a step further. Generally what happens is each cohort is just a little bit worse than the cohort before it, that they drop out just a little bit faster and you get few of them staying around for the long run. This is by no means a universal statement. And in fact, I'm delighted when I see exceptions to it, but this is just a, 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 some of the observations that we've made. So, uh, so a lot of these points, again, I, I can't do justice to them on this webinar right now, but we have documented them. We really want people to understand what these patterns look like in the data before we even go out there and, and trust the forecast and to make decisions on them. Step two would say, okay, 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 we see these patterns within and across cohorts, that's great. So now let's see uh, how well can we make these kinds of forecasts. Now let's take the data we have, split it, as I was saying before, and seeing how well these models can predict what actually these cohorts are gonna do in the future. And if that's working pretty well, great. We're gonna move on to step three. If not, we gotta go back and tweak the models. Maybe we do need to t account for seasonality. Maybe we do need to account for marketing campaigns or, or other little technical bells and whistles that we can bring in there, but we don't wanna start with. And then, it, then the fun begins. Then, then it's a matter of, okay, now that we can trust these predictions, what are we gonna do? And you know, the, the, the answer to that question is gonna depend somewhat on what we were seeing in the original data. So is it the case that, the, that, that each cohort is getting much, much, much worse than the cohort before it? In which case we're gonna focus on smart acquisition. That we wanna go out there and improve the kinds of acquisition activities we're doing to get a better yield of, of customers based on their CLVs. Um, is it that uh, we acquire customers who look pretty good, but, but the, the drop-off that we're seeing over time uh, is, is more rapid than, than what we've seen in the past or what, what we've read for other companies, in which case we're going to focus more on, uh, on, on using CLV to, to do finer uh, retention and development activities. So as we go out there and, and launch a new loyalty program, let's really understand who's using it and are we catering it towards the right kind of people and is it working to, to keep them around longer and to get them to buy more. So we'll see a lot of things in the original data set that will actually point us towards which of these different kinds of applications we're gonna wanna do with, with CLV. And again, happy to talk much more about that, but it, a lot of it will depend on the particular context. We can lay out the 50 fun things to do with CLV. And again, that was covered in the, in the previous uh, webinar and you can see the link to it in the chat window uh, right here. Uh, so I think it's, it's really worthwhile to go back and, and explore that, that uh, what Michael and I spoke about before, uh, but I'm real happy to take uh, other questions uh, that, that go beyond that. Michael? So maybe a follow-up question to that would be convincing the organization to, to do this, right? Yeah, for, let me start, maybe rephrase this question. For, for how long have you been uh, uh, leading these types of webinars, seminars, speaking at conferences about the value of, of, of CLV? Very interesting. So I've been uh, I've been talking about predictive analytics in general for my 30 years at Wharton, <laughs> but this uh, I really kind of woke up and started smelling the CLV just about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, uh, th that's when it really started catching on. Again, I'm not even going to take credit for being the 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 the, the, the person who kind of put it out there most. I just said if we're going to do this. A, we want to do it really well. We want to have methods that work. We want to be really uh, transparent and accountable about it. Uh, B, we want to think about this variety of use cases. If we're going to do this, let's, let's do, it, do it broadly. And C, maybe most importantly, is let's think about strategies that tie a lot of these use cases and methods and data structures together. And that's, of course, where we get to the customer centricity. And it's wonderful to see 
Uh, again, those are words, I never put those two words together 15 years ago. Uh, those are words that kind of emerged kind of an, almost in a bottom-up way from, hey, these methods work. Hey, these methods let us answer a bunch of different questions. So now let's step back and say, what would be a strategy that would tie a lot of those questions together? And now the eureka moment today is, hey, there's a lot of companies out there that just on their own have been moving towards this kind of strategy, but they've been doing it with a lack of, of, of sharpness. They've been doing it somewhat kind of in the dark uh, and taking you know, two steps forward, one step back. So let's try to lay out the, these broader strategies. Let's try to do so in a more universal manner. Let's try to do so in a way that we can actually learn from seemingly unrelated companies and even seemingly unrelated geographic areas. We have a lot to learn what the, what the folks in Iceland are doing these days. Uh, so it really has been an evolution from models to tactics to strategy. Uh, I'm equally interested in all of them. And depending on the company, the starting point might be different for, for one versus another. Uh, for some companies, it's, you know, our strategy is failing us. We need to change the entire organization. We need to move towards customer centricity. And oh, by the way, that requires us to, to embrace CLV. But uh, for other companies, it's more opportunistic. And you know what? We're doing pretty well, but we could be doing better. Uh, and we could be using our data and the analytics, such as CLV, to, to fine-tune particular tactical applications. So I don't want to lay out a, a single recipe for everyone, but I do want everyone to be aware of this continuum from data to models to tactics to strategy, because it does fit together beautifully. Uh, and I think it's, 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 it's important to, to, to kind of see where you are on that spectrum. Uh, I see a question here from, from Nick uh, asking specifically what data is uh, needed to measure CLV. Uh, I, I want to repeat what I said before. It can't be said enough because we have so much data out there. We're drowning in it. We're hiring armies of people just to help us manage the data. So I want to simplify that as much as possible. Transaction data. Okay, get the transaction data. Do what it takes to get the transaction data. For some companies, like I don't know, a retail or a hotel chain, a uh, um, uh, a gaming company, that kind of data is super easy to get. You just you just have it. You don't have to really um, uh, go through a lot of effort to get it. But for other companies, let's say uh, an industrial distribution company or a consumer packaged goods manufacturer, that kind of data is harder to get. And the problem is that those firms with the limited data assets have to ask this two tough questions. What kind of data do we want to start with and how much are we willing to invest to get that kind of data? So I, I want to say real clear to that first point, it's transaction data. A lot of these other data structures are nice to know. And I mentioned some of them before, geolocation, bioinformatics, uh, social media, psychographics. There's so much data out there. And too often, I see companies going for some of those other data structures because they sound interesting, because they're, of course, they're easier to collect, or because the vendors who kind of make some of that data available have just a very compelling sales pitch. But most of those other data structures do not have good predictive value to them. Like, I've been pretty negative about one of the, the really cool data structures, geolocation. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of companies out there are saying, man, oh, man, oh, man, if I can detect where my customer is when they're just outside my store, I could hit them with my message. D don't do that. <laughs> At least don't do that until you've fully collected and exhausted all of your transaction log data. So you want to get that transaction data. And then there's the second question there. So how much should we be willing to invest in it? And the, the problem is this. Let's turn the clock back 25 years when people just started talking about CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Companies were investing an awful lot to pull together all the transaction data, among other things, and they had no idea what to do with it. So if you look at the way that people talk about CRM you know, from, let's say, 15, 20, 25 years ago, they use words like disaster, frustration, waste of money, bad investment. That's because they didn't know what kind of strategic value to drive out of it, the kinds of things I was talking about a few minutes ago go. What tactics are we going to run? What strategies are we going to develop? We understand that today. There are enough uh, methodologies and use cases out there that let us see what is the ROI from having good transaction data. Companies aren't doing enough to collect and leverage tra transaction data. If anything, 
they're looking, especially the companies that don't have it naturally, they're looking at it as a cost. It's going to cost us a lot of money to develop that loyalty program or to develop those, you know, uh, transactional tracking technologies. And, and, and we'd really rather pump that money into the brand. <laughs> and they're not knocking branding, but I'm saying that you, it's, that the, the ROI you can get out of clean, accurate, timely, uh, a complete transaction data is much, much greater than you think. That if you can start calculating those CLVs, working on the different kinds of use cases that we've alluded to, uh, you can see, I don't want to say immediate uh, return on that investment, but fairly dramatic once you've had enough of that data to start projecting the CLVs, to see who the good customers are, to see what the good products are, and so on. So it's transaction data all the way, uh, and, and it's worth the investment. I think it's, it's really important for companies to have a little bit more, I don't know, patience and courage uh, to find that out for themselves. Michael, do we have uh, any other questions or do you have any reactions? Uh, before we dive into another question, uh, but I always have reactions <laughs> uh, when I hear uh, your enthusiasm. Uh, but I wanted to, to kind of circle back about how the webinar came about because it seems like uh, people are asking questions uh, whether we are still on slide seven or and whether we have more. So the way the webinar, if you will, was put together, we had the first webinar uh, where we provided, I think, some of the answers to a few questions uh, uh, that are being raised today, and we are happy to provide the slides as well as go over those. Uh, and in that webinar, we talked about the actual calculations of CLV applications uh, for featuring some of the case studies. And then uh, we had quite a bit of requests uh, from people, you know, can you help me with this question, or can you help me with this question? And obviously, you know, as much as we all love uh, for people to show up at our doorsteps and uh, crack uh, our problems, it, it's impossible. So we decided to have this follow-up uh, uh, webinar, which is um, kind of, uh, I think of it as a classroom office hours, where you come in with uh, different questions and we try to address them on the spot. So uh, again, please uh, keep uh, uh, sending us uh, those questions, as this is really a prime opportunity for you to pick uh, uh, pizza brain as you might be preparing the presentation for your company uh, or on this uh, type of content. So yeah, absolutely. To... Michael and I can have a, a lovely conversation here and we can focus on, on the other questions on the page here. Uh, but by no means are those the, the, the only ones. So, and you know what, to be real honest with you, I, I can you know answer the, the, these questions and I will. Uh, but I, I'm interested in hearing Kind of, uh, I want you to ask me a question I haven't heard before. Okay, there's my challenge to, to all of you out there in webinar land. Ask me a question about either, uh, the, it's whether it's about the data inputs, whether it's about the analytics, whether it's about the tactical use cases or the strategies that I haven't heard before. Because uh, I really want people to, uh, it's not so much stump the professor, that's not the point here. The point is I want people to really stretch their imaginations about CLV. Instead of just you know reading some uh, textbook formula for it or textbook use case of it and say yeah I guess I could do that or you know yeah is that it um, I, I really want uh, companies to to push real hard in fact that's one of the reasons why I co-founded this this Zodiac company in the first place because there's been a lot of companies out there that would do a, a one shot CLV thing let's just try it let's evaluate one group of customers or one campaign or something through the lens of CLV. But you know what? It's too expensive. It's too, uh, it's too unconventional for us to do it regularly. What I want to do is to make CLV so accessible that you can run the models all the time, multiple times a day. Let's run it for these customers and those. Let's run it for this campaign and that. Let's look, let's look at the value of the customers associated with this product or that one over there. If we can make CLV universally available to a company, then, then use cases and strategies and just kind of, you know, thinking about it um, will, will, will really evolve. And, and, and that's what I want, is, 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 is for companies to really stretch themselves on it, to, to find out if it's right for them, and if so, you know, how they, they'd really uh, see the value in it. So, um, so let's see. Let's, uh, let, let, let's see what other questions that we're getting over here. So uh, I'm seeing this question from, from Kathy saying, let's see if I can zoom in on Kathy's question. Michael, maybe you could read uh, yes, Kathy's absolutely. question. So the question is, um, and uh, Kathy, uh, no problem, absolutely, that you missed the webinar. We will send out uh, the recording and uh, happy to send the slides as well. But what about the service-based businesses? 
where the sale is heavily dependent upon a salesperson and make uh, two years to close a five million contract that lasts years. I'm not sure oh. how to use the on this. I love it. Kathy, uh, so far you, you get the, the question of the day award. Kathy, I want you and everyone else out there to look up a gentleman named Steve Lerner, Stephen Lerner. Uh, because what he did in, on exactly on this topic is, is just just incredible. Um, he used to be the director of marketing for a company called Marielle, a big veterinary pharmaceutical company. Uh, you, some of you might know them through like frontline flea collars and things like that. But he was in charge of selling antibiotics for cows and horses. So number one, this is it seems like a really unusual business setting. Uh, it's straight B2B. It's not, it's not like, it's not video games or hotel stays or, or whatever. But it turns out, first of all, that the patterns that he was observing as he was selling antibiotics for, uh, to distributors, those were his customers, to farm supply houses. Uh, he didn't have direct visibility into the farmers and veterinarians that were using the products. Uh, so it's, an, it's a very nice B2B example. He noticed that the patterns of distributors buying his products were exactly the kinds of patterns that I was alluding to earlier, buy till you die and all the stuff that I said before. And if you came in late, that's okay. This is all being recorded. Uh, so he noticed that the patterns were the same. But he also noticed that what his salespeople were doing was highly dysfunctional. They were calling on the wrong uh, distributors. They were allocating their time badly. The incentive system for them was totally messed up. It wasn't their fault. It's just that salespeople were being rewarded on the basis of orders that they booked in the past, not on the basis of CLV enhancing activities that they're taking on in the future. So what he did, long story short, and I'm very happy to share more de details about it, is he completely reorganized his sales force, both organizationally uh, as well as in terms of incentives, uh, that every quarter, he would calculate the CLV of each one of those distributors, uh, and he would reward the salespeople from, uh, based on how much CLV they elevated from last quarter to this quarter. So let's reward people for building relationships. Let's reward people for getting a, a distributor to try a sample, to show up for a webinar, to you know, take a round of golf, whatever it is. Things that, are, that they're doing that, will add, that might not show up as sales today, but will enhance the relationship and make that distributor even more valuable to us for the long run. Let's align our salespeople around those kinds of relationship building activities. Uh, uh, that was a use case that I never dreamed of, and that's why I give credit where it's due. But I think it's it's one that 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 can be done relatively easily. And I must say, I'm pretty disappointed about uh, how, even though I tell this story about Steve Lerner and Mary L very often, how few companies have had the vision, courage, whatever it is, in order to make that kind of change happen. So uh, I, I love that, that salesperson example. And I think it, it points out that the application of CLV can be much broader across the organization. It's not just which customers do we target. Um, and number two, that the, uh, that, the, that the models that I'm referring to here uh, have much broader applicability than just kind of the obvious b to c the arenas that, that, that wouldn't surprise you at all. So, Kathy, thanks for asking that excellent question. Michael, I, I see we've got some other questions coming in. This is Absolutely. fantastic. I will let you curate and uh, identify which is the best one to go after next. Excellent. The next question from Jason. What are the best practices for calculating CLV in the retail industry where customer purchase frequency can be very low and traditional churn, churn retention definitions that fit well for SaaS and other businesses don't necessarily apply. Jason, 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 that is the question. Because it because of the uh, the kind of purchase cadence that's not only low, but very variable, uh, we really need the right kinds of CLV models. In fact, there's three problems in the retail setting. Number one, we don't know when a customer goes away because it's non-contractual. The best we can do is guess or come up with a probability of whether a customer still has an active relationship with us or not. Number two is this purchase cadence thing that, that it's sparse and it's and it's and it could be really spread out. You might make a bunch of purchases over a short period of time because you're working on a project in your house, so you keep going to the you know the home supply store. Um, but then you go two years without going there again. And number three, the size of those purchases can be incredibly variable as well. You're going from ones of dollars to thousands of dollars. So we really need a model, a statistical model, that can take all that very noisy data and, and tell us what's really going on in terms of 
the length of the relationship, the cadence of the purchases and the spend per transaction. That's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. And no setting is crying out for it uh, louder and more desperately than retail. I really think that understanding these patterns, leveraging the models, engaging in the tactics and formulating the strategies around them is maybe the best way, perhaps the only way to fight off big bad Amazon. Uh, I think it's just, just really making better use of, of, of your customer data and really understanding how your customers differ from each other on the behavioral dimensions that I mentioned uh, is, is vital to be able to do these things. And I have to say, I'm pretty frustrated about how a few retailers, there are some shiny examples to be sure, but how, but how many retailers just kind of push back on this stuff saying, well, that's just not the way we run our business. And we can't run our business on the basis of a bunch of predictions. So I think it's really important to move this conversation forward. And Jason, I hope that you and, and other folks in the retail space will hear this message and will say, you know what? I do want to learn more. I do want to give it a go. Uh, I, I, I am willing to kind of try some new stuff because just uh, a lot of the more product-oriented things that retailers are traditionally very good at just, just isn't going to win the game anymore. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, we have two more questions. So let me start with this uh, question from Jordan. If the data is returned that the CLV is a negative return, what is your recommendation for proceeding? Well, that's actually one of the, the, the great applications of, of CLV. Uh, in, instead of just running our CLV models on the basis of revenues, we really should be looking at the margin that we're getting uh, from each customer and then projecting that forward. Uh, and I have a, a couple of papers uh, where we've actually done that. Uh, there's one uh, we did with a, with a big apparel retailer. And you can see those, those negative transactions coming in. And you could cleanly identify uh, who, who are those customers who you who yeah you know they buy buy from us with, with some frequency, but they're but they're cherry pickers and they're just buying stuff that that's being basically sold below cost. Uh, so you can actually start to sort out whether this is just a one-time thing. And no, they're a pretty good customer and it's okay for, for to let them cherry pick every once in a while. That's a way to kind of keep them engaged for a broader uh, relationship uh, to be able to sort that kind of you know pretty good customer out from the ones who are just incredibly strategic about the way that they buy. So you will see uh, some of those negative value customers just shine and you will understand just how much money in terms of net present value you're really losing on them. And you will understand what are the kinds of tactics that are attracting those kinds of really bad customers. Are you ready for it? One of those tactics, Black Friday. I think Black Friday is a terrible, terrible thing that companies do. It's basically putting out a great big sign saying, terrible customers, please come to us. We're going to have special hours just for terrible customers. Uh, and we want you to come only this time of year when we're selling stuff below cost. Uh, so, there's, so you really can start to get that visibility, not only the, who those customers are, but what are the tactics that you're, that you're doing to kind of <laughs> appeal to them. So I think it's really important to be looking at that low end as well as the high end. Uh, I do feel that we should spend more time at the high end, but, but still, we can get that, that visibility as well. And it can be cr uh, quite a wake-up call. I'll give you a real specific example. Just a few minutes ago, uh, just before the webinar started, I put out a, a, a two-line comment on the, on the Retail Wire website talking about Macy's new loyalty program. I think Macy's is making a terrible mistake. They just announced a new loyalty program. They're talking all about the discounts, all about the rewards. Great or bad, <laughs> but all the experiential stuff, all the stuff that's actually going to enhance the value of the relationship for good customers, we'll, we'll get to that next year. If you start with discounts, you're going to attract and retain bad customers. You want to uh, find the kinds of things that are going to attract and retain the good customers, and it's not discounts. That's not how you're going to win the game. CLV is, is just a, 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 the, the lens that lets you see that in, in, in clear distinction uh, and, and makes it harder to ignore it. So uh, really, really good question there. Time for a couple more, Michael. Absolutely. So we talked uh, quite a bit about retail. Next question comes from Nick. How does CLV apply to an ever-changing industry like, for example, automotive? Oh, it applies uh, quite nicely. It, it turns out that uh, it, it's funny because I've seen uh, applications of these kinds of models in several different uh, automotive settings. If you ignore the, the, the stuff that's 
ever changing. If, if you just take, it, just view it as an Excel spreadsheet where the rows are customers and the columns are whatever, you know, uh, profit oriented activities that they're doing with you. Let's for a moment strip aside specifically what they're buying. Just did a transaction take place? How much value did it have? Uh, it turns out that there's much more stability in automotive and in other settings than, than you think. Not to say it's, it's, it's perfect like that. I'm not saying that there are no disruptions, but, the, but you can go surprisingly long periods of time where, just, where, where you're not seeing disruption after disruption when you look at the data. And when you do see a disruption, like you know, some new model came out or some new accessory or something like that, you can get a, a better appreciation because you're saying this is what baseline sales should have been for this cohort or this micro segment. And oh my goodness, they're much higher now. Uh, let's look at the delta between what sales should have been and what they were. So you can really start to understand which of those disruptions really are disruptive and which ones are just basically small kind of ripples in the water. Uh, so we'll see that all the time. Uh, and I actually, uh, even just last week, had the pleasure of talking to an automotive accessory company that's basically doing e exactly this kind of thing uh, and, and, and bringing just real discipline to understand what kinds of initiatives that either they're taking on or, or others in the industry are really moving the needle and which kinds of customers are the ones who are most uh, affected by them. So you, you can really start to understand what's really changing and how, and what's the magnitude of it, and how customers are differentially affected by it. And so I think those are, those are pretty universal statements uh, that apply to automotive as well as retail, as well as uh, any, of the other, any of the other sectors that I've referred to. One more question, Michael. What's the best one we have queued up for us? Michael, are you still there with me? Is anyone still uh, with me? Question. Oh, there we go. Huh? Next question comes from Yahoo. Uh, which percentage of error can be accepted in the predictions of CLV for one year period, or two year period, or three year period? Oh, I like that. Getting into some of the technical stuff. Uh, I want these models to be really, really, really good. So when I fit my model over one chunk of data, and let's just say I'm looking at one cohort of customers, and, and I, I, I project what that cohort will do over the next, let's say, I don't know, four months. Um, and I see what they did, and I'm going to look at the difference between those curves. I'm going to look at the, the percent difference on a, say, a week-to-week -week basis. And, you know, how far off are they uh, on average over that holdout period? I want my models to be, I'd, I'd like them to be within 5%. I'll tolerate maybe 10%. But if there's more than a 10% difference in the holdout period, then I'm missing something. Then I don't trust the model. And I recognize that if I try to project even further out, that, 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 that deviation is probably going to spread even greater. So I have super high standards on these models. And really, I obsess over the quality of the forecasts uh, as opposed to the in-sample fit, which will probably be just as good. Again, uh, absolute percent errors of around, say, you know, uh, 5 or 10%. But I want a model that's going to perform pretty much as well out of sample in the forecast period as it does in sample. That's a real good test for me. And I, and I want to avoid the temptation to make the model fit better and better and better because that's going to create the imbalance. That's going to create the overfit where it fits super well. My goodness, I'm within 2%, but then the forecasts are off by 15 to 20%. So, so th those are some rough numbers for you, but, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty serious about them. And, and my standards uh, over uh, over a pretty long horizon are, are very high. And if we can't hit those marks, then we probably shouldn't be doing the CLV thing until we can get better data or better models. Perfect. Michael, I Thank think you. we've hit 11 o'clock. I think it is time to say class dismissed, but of course I'll, I will leave it to you to, to wrap things up. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, I see there are a few more questions from you. Thank you so much for sending them. Uh, if you would like, uh, maybe you can follow up via email and we will get back to you. Uh, there's a few other uh, technical questions. So thank you everyone uh, for joining our open office hours. Uh, if you would like to learn more, you can certainly visit uh, zodiacmetrics.com and infotrustlc.com. Uh, on both websites, uh, there, is, uh, there are a lot of different videos, blog posts, and articles about uh, CLV, about uh, analytics. Uh, you can also contact us via Twitter, email, and uh, you can see uh, Pete speak next live uh, at the eMetrics in New York, 
and uh, if you uh, like a webinar, you can attend. Uh, welcome to attend our webinar. Uh, um, this um, I guess speaker from Forrester, Boris Ellison, where we'll be discussing how CPG organizations and large enterprises can conquer digital. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending and for asking uh, so many good questions. And Pete, as always, absolute pleasure. Uh, I, the pleasure is mine, Michael, and again, thanks to all of you. Let's keep the conversation going. There's still so much to learn, still so much to do, and the best is yet to come. Thank you.